the central themes that we then, you know, flushed down and actually boiled down to some functional requirements. And so that's where the web designs that we shared, right, are, are actually a result of that input that we got from workshop participants. So we will iterate on that again, right? And um, I will share with you that doc as soon as we can get through the, the feedback. Um, so anyways, yes, of course, we want the conversation to keep going, um, but we have limited time, but feel free to use those collaborative docs. Um, they're in, the links to them are in the agenda and, you know, feel free to keep adding uh, comments and ideas. And like I said, we're, you know, going to be collecting this information and this feedback for the next couple of weeks, not too many more weeks, um, because we're going to try to, you know, summarize these ideas, uh, create a document that, that we then share, and then also incorporate feedback into some of the, the upcoming designs that we're hoping to implement um, before summer. And with our remaining time, I'm going to tell you some fun, exciting things. For those of you that stuck it out to the end, you're gonna to get to see some things that no one else has seen. <laughs> uh, so congratulations, you made it this far. And I'm gonna tell you at least what we're thinking um, for the future of, of FathomNet and some of the other um, activities that we've got in store. Um, are you guys seeing my slides? Okay, lots of um, nodding. So really our goal in 2023 is for FathomNet and the Model Zoo to grow with data and model contributions from you know, all over. Uh, that's a really big thing we'd love to see. And please let us know if there's anything we can do to help facilitate that. Uh, what we're also doing is we're establishing uh, working groups and community networks. So for instance, we have, uh, we're, we're starting to add members to our enthusiast, programmer, and marine scientist working groups. Some of you are here, have received those invitations. Uh, and, and what we're going to try and do is set up pretty regular meetings with these working groups to get feedback on, you know, things as they come um, uh, with designs, etc. Also, our hope then is that Fathom it becomes a useful resource for education, training, and capacity building, as well as uh, being a source for labeled data. And then the idea would be to host challenges to promote interaction with data science and computer vision communities, like Kaggle competitions, which I will get back to in a little bit. Um, and I wanted to actually highlight some statistics that you know I, I think we're really excited about. Um, you know, thanks to this workshop as well as the one that we've had last year, we've had 788 people register for uh, these workshops. So you know they they've been uh, engaged. They've been uh, we've been sharing content with them pretty uh, frequently. And so you know this is really important to us to have um, everybody uh, participate in this way. Uh, we've also have more than 5,000 publication downloads, the first uh, paper for uh, describing FathomNet in scientific reports. Uh, if you look at our model zoo, we have uh, more than 400 model downloads already. Um, pretty good for something that hasn't been around for too long. And we also have 335 different people who have contributed their expertise in some way to the data that lives within the FathomNet database course, we'll need more. Um, but you know, this is, I think, a fantastic start. And uh, this, this map that you see here is actually plotting um, the different locations of website users that come and, and check out the FathomNet website. So I have to say, I, you know, that that's pretty great coverage. Uh, of course, we'd want to uh, fill out this map completely. Uh, but, you know, but we're, we're, we're making strides in that direction, and so we're hoping to do these workshops a little bit more regularly than just once a year. Um, but, you know, our goal with changing these time zones is so that we can make um, times more uh, flexible and accessible for people all over the place. And finally, 69 different countries, um, people that have, have come and engaged with material on, on the FathomNet website. Uh, and, you know, part of the reason why this is, right, I, th I think a lot of us can agree, you know, the life life in the ocean is really interesting. It's it's wild and wacky. Um, I know I'm inspired by it. That's that's part of the reason why we do what we do in, in my lab, the Bioinspiration Lab. Um, but, you know, really, this is a, a mechanism for us to engage much broader audiences, right? The fact that the ocean is filled with life that we don't know very much about. And, you know, life is also a really engaging topic, too, when you think about uh, gamification and games. 
So I always like to highlight this game, Pokemon Go. You know, at its peak, there were, in 2016, there were 233 million players engaging with content about fake animals, Pokemon. Uh, but what was interesting is that the, the game itself surpassed 1 billion downloads in 2019 and made $1.23 billion in revenue based on 2020 um, dollars. And so you can imagine that's a lot of science that one could do. I'm not saying that we're ever going to <laughs> achieve those heights, but the fact is, you know, even fake animals are really um, attractive. And there are other examples of underwater games or, you know, ocean inspired games that have done very well for themselves, like Subnautica, Beyond Blue, uh, etc. And so there are things about the ocean and ocean life uh, that I think would be really engaging, including this Abzu game. And so our group has been thinking, though, a lot more, not just about Fathomet as a database, right, like a, an image repository to understand the ocean and its inhabitants. We've also been thinking a lot about, like, how do we um, go beyond that and think about ways or mechanisms to help support a global network for ocean life discovery or ocean life description. And, you know, really we're inspired by some of the work that we're seeing in other spaces. Um, I think a lot of you uh, have heard of iNaturalist. I know that was a, a program that was brought up in our marine scientist, uh, a brainstorming discussion. But iNaturalist is, um, you know, you can go to the website. It was originally a program spun out of the California Academy of Sciences, but there's like almost I think when I took this snapshot, there were less than 5 million people, I'm sure this number is much larger, that have signed up to contribute their observations of, uh, you know, wildlife or natural, um, natural things or observations, out, you know, and using their cell phones. So you can take a cell phone image and then you can submit it to iNaturalist and fellow naturalists will help you ID these things. And what's interesting, besides being able to discuss your findings and create a community around um, naturalist observations, what they've been able to do is also train um, machine learning algorithms that are class classification algorithms that are now deployed in phone apps, like one called Seek, um, where you can now point at you know, a random plant or an animal in your backyard and actually get a pretty good ID on what it is. Um, and so what's really interesting about iNaturalist is just how massive the community is, um, but, you know, the ways, the mechanisms for that engagement is really, you know, you being able to take your own image and interact with um, the data that you collect. Another group that I think has also done incredible work and is probably more in line with something that we are envisioning for, you know, the Fathomnet Plus community is this um, platform called eBird. Um, it's been spun out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And, you know, as you know, there's a very obsessive um, community around birding and, and birders, and, and they've been able to leverage that, that activity and that excitement. And so what eBird allows people to do is, you know, you, um, if other people might upload data, you can also share your own sightings. But the idea is that they have, you know, around the world, these established networks of contributors that help with IDs of, of birds, help understand uh, what what concepts or birds, bird groups within the AI models that they're running aren't performing very well and targeting, you know, areas that need more information or more data. And so instead of a, a you know, large scale general population of individuals contributing data, this is a little bit more controlled. And I think that's a lot more similar to what we're seeing with ocean related data, right? It's not very easy to generate visual data, although I know that is changing. Uh, but, you know, starting with just our community, we have plenty of data that's available. We just don't have a really great mechanism to share it more broadly. Uh, and so really what we're thinking about, like Fathomnet, when we think about Fathomnet and the future of Fathomnet is this idea of a, a global network for ocean life discovery, where we're able to develop really robust networks of contributors, you know, either through enthusiast, programmer, or marine scientist communities. And so the idea is that, you know, these networks can be, can pop up in different locations so that we also get regional coverage Right. Again, that goal of, of being able to expand our biological observation capacity in the ocean. And so what I wanted to let you know um, that we're very, very excited about is we pitched this idea 
to the National Science Foundation as part of their Convergence Accelerator Program. And the project is called Ocean Vision AI, or OVI, to accelerate observations in marine life using artificial intelligence. And so this is a three year long program, a 6 million or 5.75 million US dollar effort. And we were successful at uh, getting funding. And we're now just a little under a year and a half or halfway through the three year process. And so what we were funded to do um, was, was first to do what we're calling use inspired research interviews. So reaching out to the community, talking to people, obviously these workshops were another mechanism for us to do this, but to really understand what the needs were or what were the gaps uh, in the community, but also talking to groups outside of our community to understand existing solutions. Uh, and so through that process, we had 38 uh, individual or one-on-one -on -one user interviews. We had game development workshops. And then thankfully, because of you know, our FathomNet workshops, you know, that number is actually much higher. And so what was interesting is that there were um, some general themes that kind of came out of these conversations. You know, the fact that there is a real challenge to collaboration uh, within our communities, like the main stumbling block is that marine, uh, the marine community is collecting data in silos. Um, but if we're really serious, right, of being able to really scale our capacity or scale up our uh, ability to do these observations, we really need to come up with global solutions that uh, enable and include global perspectives. Uh, another thing that came out was that there is a lack of accessible tools. Um, you know, face it, we're all very, very busy. We don't have a lot of time to spin up new tools in our lab. And honestly, unless the tool was super simplified, there might not be very many people that have the capacity to, to start something. So that was really important um, feedback. And then also there's just a general lack of AI knowledge. Um, there's a lot of people out there who actually think that these models work perfectly. You can just train them and then run them on any type of data, and then you'll get something valuable or useful. And, and that is just not true. Um, and, and that really what we should be focusing on is more like, how do we work with models within you know, our data pipelines or data workflows so that we can more efficiently process data and, and, and slowly make our way to, you know, one day being able to fully automate these processes. Um, and then the, the fourth theme is that there are obviously many uses for AI. The fact that, you know, there's a lot of video that's been watched, but there's terabytes of data that haven't been annotated. And that's a problem, right? There's a lot of information locked away in these data stores that we just haven't been able to, to use or, or, or um, you know, uh, apply to some of our analyses. And then finally, so many broad data use cases. The fact that visual data, right, has a lot of different uses and that it really shouldn't be optimized for the first user's needs. And if video data were more broadly available, more people can take a look at it and assist. Uh, and so given these themes, uh, what we did or what we very much learned was that labeled data, you know, things like FathomNet, really isn't enough to address these concerns or challenges in the marine science community. And there was clearly gaps that we, we thought that we could fulfill. And so as part of that, we've started to establish uh, these strategic partnerships. The um, PIs and co-PIs, the leads of the program, uh, involve very similar uh, folks you might see uh, as part of the FathomNet project. But we've also incorporated um, uh, researchers at Purdue University, as well as uh, Senku, so data aggregator, uh, um, and then we've also been participating or interacting with uh, people with different expertise, like game design, um, game design uh, backgrounds, or understanding of human computer interactions and human AI interactions. Uh, we've also uh, been partnering, we are partnering with um, groups that are, are big generators of, of visual data. Of course, what we're trying to create isn't just going to address their data needs, but also the data needs more broadly. And then we're also engaging, um, you know, outreach uh, organizations like the Smithsonian, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and even Eline Media, the video game developer or creator for Beyond Blue. Um, and so the idea is that we can create solutions 
you know, that could, could almost result in something like an iNaturalist or an eBird, but focused on ocean life discovery. And finally, uh, we partnered with Impact Observatory. They're a group that um, generates these data dashboards that wind up going to the United Nations and into the hands of people who make really important decisions about, um, you know, biodiversity and other efforts. And so based on these user interviews, a lot of uh, ideation and brainstorming, what we've decided was that we could create uh, products and services that could address these needs, and they can all be linked together. Uh, the first one that I think you all recognize, right, is FathomNet. So the idea is that FathomNet is going to be one of these products living under the umbrella of Ocean Vision AI. Um, and so we're not changing anything about FathomNet. This is basically a mechanism for us to continue moving FathomNet forward and also incorporate, um, you know, improvements, let's say, in the machine, the, the FathomNet model zoo, so that it, it continues to address the needs of the community. So nothing here is going to change. FathomNet exists, it lives, it's breathing, and there's ways to either contribute data to FathomNet, uh, contribute models, integrate or interact with data and models as well. What is new is uh, a portal. So it's a, it's a mechanism for us to enable people who don't have the capacity for uploading their visual data or having um, their, their data hosted somewhere. And the idea too is that users can interact really um, easily with uh, either the FathomNet uh, labeled data or the models within the model zoo. And what this will enable is, you know, um, also the ability to create public or private repositories, collaborative mechanisms for uh, looking at visual data, also selecting and training, and also deploying uh, machine learning models as well as verification. But I think what's really important here is that we're trying to create really streamlined pathways to get your annotations exported uh, into a searchable database or, um, or FathomNet. Uh, and I think something that I will probably excite a lot of the enthusiasts here is that we're also working on a third product called Fathomverse, at least that's the working name. And what it is, is it's a game. And so the idea that, you know, there are definitely enough people out there who could probably tell the difference between a squid and let's say a, um, a sponge. Uh, and, and frankly, right, that is an amazing starting point for a lot of the visual data that we've collected, right, that doesn't have any annotations, that doesn't have any localizations. And so if we could create a mechanism for um, enthusiasts to start interacting with the model, model predictions, providing at least the first layer of verification that we can then kind of hone in on more deeply um, as, you know, we recruit more and more experts into FathomNet, that that is an approach that we are are looking into and taking, and so the working name right is the Adam Verse, and the, the 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 tagline is exploring the final frontier on Earth. The audience, the primary audience for this, is ocean lovers, animal lovers, and armchair explorers, uh, and then the secondary audience is you know communities that are underrepresented in ocean science. Um, so this is a really important piece for our team and and the the target audience that we're trying to uh, pursue. We're also focused on high school age and up, and the idea is that we can use a mobile phone app, either downloads for iOS or Android, that people then can engage with this, this visual data. And really, based on the, the people that we've been talking with, the, you know, the, the people that we've been querying, we've, we've been polling lots of different people, uh, lots of people are interested uh, because of their love of animals, their interest of animals are just really wanting to know facts about the ocean. And so that's the kind of content we're trying to create and share within the game. And so one of the, I mean, the, these are the pillars of the design of the game, the idea that we can uh, prioritize discovery or provide a mechanism for exploration and players to interact with maybe different parts of the ocean or different types of animals they might be interested in. The other thing too, is we wanted to create um, a, an environment for blissful productivity. It's definitely not a shoot 'em up game, but an idea that this is something that you can do without a lot of effort um, to then also feel blissfully productive. Um, and the idea is, is, is rewarding productivity and not performance. 
Uh, casual play is important. So it's not something we want people to like sit behind their computer with, you know, a particular joystick controller and play. This is actually something we're hoping people can do in short, in short sprints, um, you know, maybe during their morning commute or waiting for their kids at a soccer game, whatever. Um, but these are, this is the approach we're taking within the game. Uh, and then I think what's really inspiring or exciting is that players will have the opportunity to contribute to a mission. And we're not we're not creating a fake narrative or false narrative around this. We are essentially telling people that their contributions will help us develop new AI, help us discover potentially new life in the ocean, because now we're finally able to unlock information in visual data that we haven't been able to do before. Um, so those are the, the pillars. And right now we um, have a high level game structure planned out. The idea is players will, you know, go through the splash screen and get the introduction and then they'll go to a central hub where there they will have the opportunities to figure out or to interact with different features, select different mini games. And it's these mini games that are going to allow interaction with the actual data, right? So either machine generated proposed regions of interests that players might try to correct and classify or having people um, you know help draw bounding boxes or either like segmentation masks for animals that require that. Um, but I think really importantly, what sets aside this approach, this gaming approach from existing community science or citizen science efforts is the fact that we can provide feedback in real time or even delayed time for players so that they can understand how, how, you know, what are they learning? How are they contributing? And how are their contributions, um, uh, you know, affecting gameplay or changing the ways in which we, we do this kind of work? And that's something we can incorporate in the game. It's really hard to do in other citizen science or community science efforts. I'm going to dive a little bit into the hub. So the idea is that at least the timeline, we're going to be releasing a minimum viable product or an MVP of the game in July of this year. Um, and so what you see here in, in blue circles are the uh, aspects or the features of the game that will be a part of that MVP release. And then these other circles are things that we have plans to incorporate, but that would be more in the version one of the game, which we're hoping to release in January of 2024, so early next year. So the idea is that you enter the hub and you have the option to select a number of different things. The first mini game we will uh, release is a classification mini game. Uh, players will also be able to select different missions uh, and also view their progress. So missions could be like find six squid or find, you know, 10 uh, larvations. And those missions can be spread across a number of different visual data sources. Uh, players can also view their, their um, overall score. The idea is that you can gain um, points and that can then be used to unlock new missions or new content that we might be introducing to the game. Uh, and then what we're trying to do is borrow from what's really successful in the birding community is, is creating a gallery of people's societies, creating like life lists for different kinds of ocean animals that people then can spend time trying to fill. And so that will be um, displayed in, in the gallery of sightings. And other things will include ocean maps, uh, a digital museum, so of like new animals as they come in, uh, mechanisms for community progress and sharing of missions, the idea that you could potentially collaborate with other people while playing the game. Of course, there's other mini games that we're envisioning, like a, a different annotation type. But I think what's really exciting, because FathomNet exists, there's, an, there's going to be a straightforward mechanism for us to escalate findings to experts. So say a player comes across something that they think is interesting or they think might be new, and if they have enough XP points or um, points, they can phone a friend or phone an expert through the FathomNet network. So that's something that we're trying to, to build out and, and, and think about too. Unfortunately, I don't have, um, I, I forgot to include a, at least a view of what you know the 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 first mini game might look like, but these are sketches of of what that could be, and it involves kind of going around in a three dimensional environment, looking at different regions of interests, and having players select uh, images that can be added to their collection and uh, classified later. Uh, so that's 
all part of it. And again, this feedback part is incredibly important. The idea that, you know, not only can players get instant feedback by uh, evaluating classifications uh, on new data, but also data that's coming from FathomNet that's been verified from experts. So we can evaluate gameplay as we go. But also the fact that as experts or as individuals start to verify data in FathomNet, because it's linked to the game in some way, players can get more points as their IDs are, are verified by experts. And so there's a way we're able to do that because this entire data infrastructure is, is all integrated. So the idea then is that you know IDs will go either from the Fathomverse to the portal or back in, up into FathomNet. And through these three products, we can help grow this eco ecosystem even more um, and more quickly. So the program timeline, um, the idea is that you know, we're launching the first version, uh, getting, getting through beta and into version 1.0 in early summer. Uh, and then we're going to beta launch the portal as well as the game in, in mid-summer, so in July. Uh, and then we're going to be launching uh, Fathomverse version 1.0 in January of next year, uh, followed by another version of the game, which we're trying to evaluate. You know, is this going to be a museum or aquarium-based game? We're not sure yet. Um, but that will also be accompanied with a, a version 1.0 of, of the portal. Uh, other activities that we're going to be involved in, too, is thinking about how do we sustain our activities as part of Ocean Vision AI. Uh, this is something that NSF is really, really focused on this in this call. We want to create something. They want to uh, support something, but they also want to make sure that this lives on beyond the two-year funding or the three-year funding program. And so we're going to spend a lot of time uh, pursuing sustaining funding models for this effort. Uh, and then finally, uh, lots of engagement activities. So obviously, this workshop is part of that. Uh, we want to broaden participation, and I just wanted to announce that we are doing uh, an official FathomNet Kaggle competition as part of the CVPR conference uh, focused on distribution shifts, and I believe that competition will be released in a week or two. So if that's something you're interested in checking out, please do. And again, I just want to remind you, right, this is where we are now, and where we want to be is something like this, where we have much better coverage of biological, you know, observations throughout the ocean. And we're hoping, you know, that Ocean Vision AI and FathomNet will help us get to that point. Um, and so with that, I am happy to take any questions. We're just excited to be making a video game, among other things. Video game priority number one. <laughs> All right. One question? <laughs> I mean, if not, we can also uh, take questions at the next optional stage, which is the, um, the gather town. Um, and I'm hoping somebody could put the link there. Uh, yes, got to annotate them all. <laughs> But in terms of funding, are we looking more nationally or globally? No, we're looking globally. Um, of course, I'm more familiar with the you know national sources or pots of funding. But for instance, we pitched this idea to the TED Audacious program, um, which does uh, provide significant funding. Uh, but if you are coming up with if you come across any other funding opportunities, uh, you know, please, please let us know because we want to make sure that you know, FathomNet, as well as these other products live on beyond the, you know, the, the three-year uh, funding uh, period for the Convergence Accelerator. And yes, to, to Char, we are looking for volunteers and interns. Um, and so that's something we're trying to think about too, is how do we engage more effectively a, a lot of different people to, to help us reach our end goals. Um, right. So with that, I think we're out of time. So I wanted to just thank everybody for joining us. Um, big thank you to everybody who, who you know, shared content, um, provided feedback. Um, this isn't over. <laughs> we will be talking more uh, soon, but again, there's so many different ways to reach out to us. So please, please do. Um, it looks like there's one more question. 
Right. Uh, so a lot of taxonomists do these types of IDs in their spare time. How do we make this work there a while? So this is a big reason why we are incorporating ORCIDs into user IDs, because what we're doing, uh, thanks to NOAA, is we're versioning the database. And with every version, there's a, you know, a DOI that's assigned to the, the version of the database. And so um, people who then contribute to the database between versions can also have their ORCID um, associated with that, that DOI. Um, and so that's that's something we're working towards. We haven't implemented that yet, but we want to make sure people are getting credit for their contributions. And that is one way that we're trying to do that. Can this game fund its own growth? Good question. I'm happy to chat about that over in the gather town if you want to join us. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody.